I am Andrew Oak. I am the First Ladies Man. Thank you for your attention, your interest in having me here tonight. And I'm, 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 told, I'm told that we, we can take some, some questions um, and, and things like that. There's something, oh my gosh, there's something happening here. Oh, well, thank you, Andrew. That was absolutely wonderful. And this is thank you very much. Oh my gosh. I did, well, thank you very much. These are beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, so if, if there are questions, we, we can entertain them now. We can, uh, sure. What, what, what's, your, what's your question? Um, she, she is. Alice, Alice Roosevelt is, I don't mean to interrupt, is that no. Alice Roosevelt is the first daughter and only daughter of Theodore Roosevelt's first marriage to a woman named Alice. This brings up another point that studying these women was very, very difficult because many of the daughters were named after them, their mothers, and there was a Martha, everyone was named Martha, Martha Washington, Martha Jefferson, Jefferson's wife who was dead 20 years before he got into the White House, but their daughter, his official White House hostess, was Martha Patsy Jefferson Randolph, and I don't understand Patsy from Martha, so keeping all these names crazy, and then you think, well, as things get more modern, I'll understand things, then Alice is born to a woman named Alice to Teddy Roosevelt, who isn't, and the Roosevelts is such a story, but, but, but she, was a, she, was, she, was, she was a live wire, Alice Roosevelt. Um, she felt, I think, a little slighted. Her mother, was, her mother uh, died uh, very shortly after birth from the same kidney disease, I believe, that killed Ellen Wilson, our Rose Garden First Lady. And Teddy Roosevelt, again, being Teddy Roosevelt, was not pleased. And when Teddy Roosevelt is not pleased, he goes on safari or takes a canoe down the Amazon or goes and herds cattle out in Montana and does crazy things which are fun. And he leaves some folks in the wake of that. But he gave his daughter, Alice, to his sister to take care of and raise until he rejoined with his uh, 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 childhood sweetheart, um, Edith, Edith uh, Caro, Edith Kermit Caro who became Edith Roosevelt. And, and she was one of a very, very exciting time in Washington, D.C. And that was the Roosevelt administration and all those kids. And it's interesting that you bring up, keep in mind also that the McKinley administration had come before this. They lost both daughters very, very young. Mrs. McKinley, as we discussed, had epilepsy. So it was not a swinging from the chandelier, rum punch, everybody have a good time, White House, the McKinley White House. It was good in many other ways, it just wasn't big party time. Like the Grant administration after the Civil War, say, was a very good time. That would have been a good party to go to. The McKinleys, not so much. But the Roosevelts move in with this crazy active family, and you're right, animals like a zoo. My favorite story about the other Roosevelt daughter, um, uh, Oh, there's so many women running around in my head right now. <laughs> his other daughter, not Alice, and it, was, it starts with an E, and it's not Edith because that's his wife, and that's where I'm getting hung up. Hung up. But it's but it, it, not Eleanor because that's... Yeah. Yeah. Elaine, was it? I'm, oh, okay. Well, that's a good guess. <laughs> Kennedy or Roosevelt, just yell something. Uh, so, so, so the other, the other Roosevelt daughter came into the Oval Office right before her father is about to have a meeting with a very important, I think, the president or prime minister of Japan, and she, she's holding her guinea pig, and she runs up to her dad, and says, Dad, 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 Teddy Jr. and and Quentin, they, they say they're going to feed the guinea pig to the hyena or the rat. They had all this stuff. They had hyenas. They had a pony named Algonquin that rode the, the, the elevator. It's the only pony to ride the elevator to visit. Uh, one of the kids was sick and things like that. It was, it was, it was a madhouse. And, and the public loved it. Couldn't get enough of it. So she runs in and says, you know, Kermit's going to feed the guinea pig to the hyena or whatever. He's like, there, there, you know, just here, give me the guinea pig. Takes it and puts it in his suit pocket. Turns around and they're bringing the Japanese prime minister president. That guinea pig slept in TR's pocket during the entire meeting. And to Ethel, hey, <laughs> Ethel Roosevelt, till he returned it to Ethel after the meeting with the prime minister. But they did. They had, we, we talked about this. It was very interesting. This goes into modern time as well, the way the Roosevelts protected their children. All families, this is another thing that makes young women, young families very attractive to the, to the public, is young children of which the Roosevelts had many, and all the animals, and all the wild stories, and everything. But she did, because there's a great appetite for the people to 
get to know these children, these cute little children, little kids and everything, is she had a very well-known society photographer take a number of pictures. And she would release them in articles and periodicals and papers so the public felt they were getting this access to the children that they needed. But it's one thing you say, I mean, my gosh, the, the Obamas did a phenomenal job. I think the Bushes uh, did a pretty good job as well, uh, uh, given the ages of, of both of their, their children, uh, to, to raise these children out of the public eye. I, I mean, remember, I'm, I'm old enough to remember uh, the, the Carters, Amy Carter and Chelsea Clinton, uh, that both... Um, you could say went through their awkward stage. We all have them, and, and people said horrible things. They said mean, mean things, and it only grows and, and, and gets bigger and broader with social media and, and the internet and all this kind of stuff like that. But the, the Roosevelts are fascinating. It's, it's wonderful to bring up the, 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 Alice, the Alice story, because she she's a story all on her own. Uh, any other questions or, or comments about the series or something? Yep. It is. Um, I'm going to tell you, not for self-serving purposes, just for ease, as I've made it very easy, if you go to my website, firstladiesman.com, this will make sense, I promise. <laughs> if you go to firstladiesman.com, the, the C-SPAN link is the first one at the top of the video page. Firstladiesman.com, I find to be easier than www.c-span.org slash firstladies. So if you would rather remember the C-SPAN link, you watch the C-SPAN link and do that. But it's the same link that's on my website. It's nothing, it's nothing different. And you can watch the videos that I showed you here from each. You can watch the series out of order. You can pick your favorite first lady and go back and pick extras. There's extra video there. Because another reason why I do this, what I, at the end of this, there's only 90 minutes in 90 minutes. And we had live guests. So each of these vignettes that happened for each of the first ladies, I would spend six, eight, ten hours at each of these locations that I could have done a 90-minute show on that location, so, like I could do 90 minutes on, on one of the dresses that I saw at, at Grace Coolidge's museum. They're gorgeous, or McKinley. They're just, they're just amazing. And we, we edited and paired. There's, there's so much on the edit room floor that I found that I was still talking about them long after the series, and people weren't asking me to stop. So I just kept talking about it, and then eventually I made it in front of a microphone and other things like that, and I'm here today. But the, the, the stories are truly remarkable, and that also inspired my book, which is also at the website. There's a plug for me. That, one, that, that, one's, that one's open and honest. But at, at firstladiesman.com, there's a lot of articles and commentary and a lot of extra video and things like that. There was another question I saw. A couple, okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah. She got a lot of criticism with it. Were politicians jealous of the position of the first lady? Absolutely. Uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful point. And again, this is something that um, is, is very interesting in the, in the fickleness and in the short-term memory that, that I mentioned. George Washington wouldn't be George Washington without Martha Washington. Abigail Adams said, don't run for vice president, run for president. These are the women that share a life and a bed and a family with the president. They're going to talk. When you guys come home from work, your wife, husband, significant other says, hey, honey, how was work? Well, a whole shipment of flowers died today. What am I going to do with that? What am I going to do with that? President Trump comes upstairs and Melania says, hey, honey, how was work today? Let's talk about health care. Let's talk about Putin. Let's talk about it's his business. Obama the same. Bush the same. Carter all the way back to Reagan. So the, 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 the fuse was lit when I think Ronald Reagan made some sort of announcement or decision or, or, or policy or something. And, and someone said, well, does, you know, does your wife know about this? He said, well, yeah, of course. I don't, I don't make any decisions without running them by my wife. Boom, man, you killed. We didn't elect, you didn't, what, are you, who? That woman, to, to, she's not, you know. Now let's fast forward. And I remember very accurately that Clinton campaigned saying you get two for one. And everyone thought that was a great idea. And it, I mean, it was. Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton's one of the smartest. This is an interesting aspect. Think about this. Let's say Hillary Clinton won. Bill Clinton would not be picking out China patterns and hosting tea parties. <laughs> He's a former president. The question that I got from day one of my very first speech was, 
What are we going to call him? <laughs> I, I, it's, a, it's a valid question. It's a good question. But that was number one on people's mind. What are we going to call him? Well, you, you call him Mr. President. Until we invent a position that's higher and Clinton runs for it, Bill Clinton, and wins it, he's President Clinton. Hillary Clinton, I know, is smart. So if you walk into President Hillary Clinton's Oval Office, I would venture a guess this or this would be the number of times you saw those two together in the same room. We rarely saw them together as senator and former president. Where's Bill Clinton's strengths? Similar to Melania Trump on the international stage. He's a de facto Secretary of State. He's out doing his ambassador work, raising money, smiling, kissing babies, shaking hands, going to visit all the former you know, leaders that he worked with, as opposed to walking into a room, and let's say I'm the leader, I'm the president of, you know, any, I'm the president of France, okay? My wife and I walk into a room, and there's President Clinton and President Clinton. Power struggle. Bill Clinton's no shrinking violet, folks. I hate to you know, give you new information on that. He's not going to take a back seat. He's going to go up and he's going to shake hands. Here's the point of all this. Who's going to be first lady? Chelsea. Chelsea would do more in the Clinton administration than her husband when it came to first lady duties. And that's not rare. It's not rare. Because when first ladies have been sick and when first ladies have been non-existent, or when first ladies have died, every niece, daughter, cousin has stepped in to perform those duties. What makes it unusual and unexpected and a bit unexplained is if Melania takes a back seat is that she's young, she's in good health, and there's no reason why she can't, except for the fact that maybe she doesn't want to. But that is yet to be seen. We don't know. But this was such an unusual election cycle. In, in, in terms of what this unelected role would turn into and happen. But to answer your question to get back, I think there were a lot of people very jealous of the relationship that the Reagans had. Nancy Reagan did a, did a CBS a 60 Minutes special when, um, when Ronnie was diagnosed with, with Alzheimer's, and it's, it's tear-jerking. It's, it's, I'm sure there's people in this room who've had similar experiences. I, I have with, with, with my mother. People are taken from us far too early. It's a horrible disease, and she said that her golden years, her retirement years, were taken from her, that her best friend. And there's letters. When they would travel independently, they would see, Ronald Reagan, when he, was, when he was governor or when he was president of the uh, Screen Actors Guild, he would be at a convention or something like you guys are tonight, you know, sitting up in New York or D.C. or whatever, writing letters. And I've done this. Now we do it in text message or we take a picture. Hey, look, I did it tonight. Hey, there's the, there's the surf and turf. Isn't this great? Wish you were here. And I'll text it later. But Ronnie did it in written form. They said, you would have loved the dessert. We would have laughed at that lady with the hat. And this man was singing when the violinist came by and something. The steak was a little overdone. You would have complained, but I'd have taken it back for you. They, they were such, uh, even arguably, at the, at the, at the, at the, the sacrifice of, of their children in certain aspects, because they got a little weird at, at times. And I think it's because Ronnie and, and Nancy were so connected um, that it didn't leave a lot of time for other people. I mean, they had their careers and they did, you know, they didn't ignore everything. But they they were just they were a true love match. They were a true love match, like the Coolidges, like the Trumans, like the Washingtons. There's a lot in there that I discovered that's just that's just simply romantic. It's it's fantastically romantic. Some of the love stories in the in the White House. But they were very jealous. I think people in the administration that Nancy had that much power and pull over her husband. There was no. But she did. Here's why I don't typically. Here's why I don't typically mention Dolly Madison, Eleanor Roosevelt, or Jacqueline Kennedy. No, because I knew that you would. You brought it up for me, which is great. I count on people like you. Now, sorry, in the back, did you raise your hand for the remote control? New favorite in the room. There's a new favorite in the room. Dolly Madison did. Do Dolly. Dolly Madison, another reason why I don't bring her up in the prepared remarks is because 
as you can tell, I'm, I'm not short-winded. But we were speaking, a gentleman here at the table is from Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, there's the Dolly Todd house. Did you know that Dolly Todd was Dolly Todd before she was Dolly Madison? She was married to a Quaker lawyer in Philadelphia who died during the yellow fever uh, uh, epidemic of the early 1800s. I don't know the exact year. Her husband, her first husband died and, and um, their youngest son and I think a, a house servant as well. Um, to go in the Dolly Todd house at, in Philadelphia is remarkable. She was a homebody self-educated, taught her brothers and sisters, moved her sister into her house with her and her first husband, slight, meek, tiny person in the grand scheme of things when she walked in the back door of this house from her mother's boarding house. The transformation that happens to that woman to become the woman that we talk about today is miraculous. Again, by the simple happenstance of a disease, a premature death of a, of a spouse. Next thing you know, Aaron Burr is staying at her mother's boarding house. He's got this friend, little Jimmy Monroe. And Jimmy doesn't talk to many girls. Very serious book guy. But Aaron says, I, you know what? I know a very attractive young woman, very intelligent, probably unusual for her time, and I'd like to set you two up. So I go into the room on the second floor of the parlor where in all likelihood they would have met. It's the formal room of the house. And to think that a woman that never traveled outside of the continental United States would then go to host dinners for foreign dignitaries where people would say it was as if she was trained in the finest finishing schools of all of the world. She put people that didn't agree with things next to the person that didn't. When the White House burned and she did save that, original George Washington painting, which was miraculous, rolled it up, got it in the carriage, and got shipped out to what is now the Dunbarton Mansion at Dunbarton Oaks here in Washington, D.C. It was owned by the Carroll family at the time. What she was doing at that house was she was waiting for the Secretary of the Navy to come up because the Navy Yard had just been burned. That's where they ran up to the White House and said, get out of here. You know another thing she did in the White House after taking the painting down and salvaging that? She said, Set the table and put out the finest china and things. I don't want the British troops to think that I can't set a table and I can't put out. <laughs> and they did. And the British troops came in and they ate. And they threw the plates up at the wall like a Greek wedding, man. They just went nuts in that place and then lit it on fire and split. So Dolly Madison is at the Carroll House waiting for the Secretary of the Navy to come, grab her, and go across the Potomac where Madison's waiting for her. When they come back, they then occupy the Octagon House. This is where Dolly Madison put on the dinners and her, I, I think they called them elbow rooms or, or elbow parties or something, because there were so many people in the room, you were literally elbow to elbow. She also picked the octagon house because as you walk into the foyer, it is the shape of an octagon. Yes, amazing how they did that back then. It was so smart. It wouldn't have, who would have thought? But yes, it's an octagon foyer, and she liked it because no one could get stuck in a corner. And everyone was forced to talk to everyone until she wedged them into this tiny little room. Now, here's the other thing. A Quaker, a good Quaker, of which Dolly was in her, in her first marriage, was not uh, known for their parties, we'll just say. Dolly Madison's parties became legendary <laughs> to this day. Her rum punches, her whiskey punches, I've seen her snuff box. The woman knew how to throw a party for the time. She knew how to put the political adversaries together and force them to work together to do things. Amazingly influential woman. And to see, I, I, I recommend that house in Philadelphia almost more than any other thing in Philadelphia, knowing what Dolly Madison did for this country and for the White House, to see, and the funny thing is, is that the woman, very, very nice woman, park ranger up there, we do the, the, the routine that I would do when I get to one of these locations that a lot of them I'd never been to before. I load in my seven bags of gear. I hold my back. I say, ah, oh, that really hurts. And then I explain, no, I don't have any help, and no, I don't have anyone else coming with me at this point. Then I say, show me around your place, and let's go take a look. We go through the rooms, and the stories start to come together in my mind. I see what's going to be 
before the White House, during the White House, what artifacts they put together. Okay, great. And after we do the full loop circle, I've got it mapped out. Get my camera on my shoulder, mic up the person, I say, let's go. So this woman, park ranger, at uh, Mary, Mary was her name, Mary something, it'll come, maybe it'll come to me, maybe. Maybe it'll come to me, but I'm almost positive her name was Mary. She was very, very nice, took me through the talk, taught me things about Dolly Madison. I couldn't read in stories. It was fantastic. Boom, red light on the camera goes, and she goes, wow, this is different than talking to a group of school kids or tourists. Or thing. And I was like, we made it. We made it through the day. But when we got out to the end, I had a rental car. It was starting to snow. And I had to get, I don't have a rental car tonight, but I had a rental car that night and I needed to get back from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. to turn in the rental car to get home, feed the dogs, the whole kind of thing. It was supposed to be a day trip. Or it was the, actually, it was the end of a very long trip through Pennsylvania. But we get outside, we've got one more puzzle piece to put in place. And I'm like, all right, Mary, bring it on home. Just couldn't summarize it. Couldn't think. There's, there's almost too much about Dolly Madison that how do you, how do you give me some tag outs for these stories that we've put together? And I looked and I said, well, let's think about the journey that we've done here. We've, we've, we, we physically walked in the back door. We went upstairs. We learned about her as a young Quaker mom and her sister. Went upstairs. Her husband dies. She meets Madison. She comes down, walks out the front door of this place and goes on to be the most influential woman. And I was like, hey, that ain't bad. <laughs> I've, it, it happened right in front of my eyes. It was it was literally one of the most remarkable experiences of the entire series. I saw a woman looking down in an apron, walking into the back door, not saying anything, walking out, 10 feet tall, turban, fashion icon for decades to come, bottle of rum under one arm, Madison and the other to go on to be one of the most influential first ladies in, in, in our country. And, and that is, that's America right there. That's, that's, that's what can happen in the confines of, of one house and 10, 15 some odd years of, of, the, of the, the women that again, I mean, if there was anyone who didn't set out or was unlikely to become a first lady, that, that would be Dolly Madison to come out to be one of, the, one of the most notable and successful and influential. It's just remarkable to me. So there's my Dolly Madison. I think we're good. If anyone else has any questions, I, I, we're going we're to let some people, please come up to me afterwards, and we can, we can sit and chat here. I've got no curfew tonight, plenty of, plenty of food and all the bowls at home, and uh, I, I would love to chat with, with each and every one of you that has a question. Thank you again to the group and, and, and the wonderful first lady that you all have for the introduction and everything, and have a wonderful night tonight. Thank you very much.